Hi, friends. Come on in and make yourself at home. I'm Gio. I like to write gay fiction. Don't tell me. I already know. There's no market for it. Seriously, though, go check a regular bookstore or a used bookstore or library and tell me how many you find. Around here, the answer is almost zero. That's why I'm presenting what I write on my little channel. If you missed chapter 3 of Speeding, it not only delves into the reconciliation of Ethan and Pete, but it gives Ethan's basic philosophy. He only keeps 200 things. If you would like to see his list, check out that chapter. For now, it's time for chapter 4. Thursday, August 4th, Ethan. I spoke with Pete until way too late, and I felt it in every bone and muscle in my body. Give me caffeine by the bucket. I pulled up to the station, ten minutes before 7 a.m. I'd dropped Sabretooth off at Mom's place, and I'd pick Sabretooth up tomorrow morning on my way home. The Dead Men's Butte Municipal Police Department and Fire Station Number 341 was an old red brick elementary school renovated with a new entrance to make it look modern. My home for one day every three days. The parking lot was a lot fuller than it should have been. The guys from A Shift must still be here. As I climbed out of my car, I balanced the extra trays of brownies I had made. They wouldn't last half an hour around these guys. We have three shifts, A, B, and C. I'm on B shift, and A shift should have gone home, but their cars were still in the parking lot. Why were they here? Tia and I nodded at each other as we entered, neither of us ready for conversation until after we've had our first cup of coffee. She saw the brownies, smiled, and beelined towards me. As she quickly grabbed one, she said, I like having you as a partner, but you are bad for my waistline. She gestured at the station. The ambulance was gone. I set the triple chocolate cheesecake brownies down on the kitchen table and quickly took one. If I didn't now, I wouldn't get one once everybody saw them. Where's the rig? Tia asked Dietrich from A-Shift. He's on the pumper truck. Early morning car accident with injuries. 342 got the call, but they needed both our ambulance as well as theirs to take patients to the hospital, Dietrich said, yawning. 342 was our sister station on the other side of the butte. Dietrich saw the brownies and ran over. Ethan, we have to get you on A-shift. Did Ethan bring brownies again, Banner said. He's on the B-shift ladder truck. He knows how to stay on our good side, Jesse said. He's on the B-shift pumper truck. The chief wants to talk to everybody, Clint said, and snagged a brownie. He was the usual driver for the B-shift ladder truck and shift chief for B-shift. Chief, when are you going to transfer Ethan to A-shift? It's not fair he always brings brownies and cookies for B-shift, Steph yelled and stepped into the kitchen and grabbed a brownie. She's A-shift on pumper truck. Then I shouldn't tell you about the time Ethan brought fresh baked rolls, Harry said. He works on the pumper truck for B-Shift. Steph and Dietrich, you should transfer to B-Shift, Tia said, because we're not sharing. What's the meeting about, Chief? Dietrich said, pretending to pout while stuffing another brownie in his mouth. The Chief, Freddy Alvers, entered the room carrying several papers. He was in command of Station 341 and served on A-Shift on the pumper truck. He glanced up and grabbed a brownie. No transfers today, Tia. We'll start the meeting as soon as Carson and Dodds get back, he said. Dispatch said they're leaving Long Ridge and heading here. Two men followed the chief. The first was early thirties, blonde, and hooked his thumbs on his belt. The other was early twenties, dark hair, dark eyes. He had a tattoo on his forearm of a dragon that reached into his sleeve. His arms were folded and his eyes widened as he took in all the people. Help yourselves to the brownies before Dietrich eats them all, Steph said. The blonde man smiled and took one. The dark-haired man remained withdrawn. My wife will want that recipe, the blonde man said, taking a healthy bite. Between the two crews, 
We'd have 26 people here once Carson and Dodds arrived. I should have made four dozen brownies instead of three. Do we have to save any brownies for Carson and Dodds? It's more for us, Dietrich asked. If you don't, I'll tell them, and you know how Carson gets when there's food around, Chief said. Who's the new guys? I asked. That's Bacon and Xavier, and I'd rather explain everything once the others get here, the chief said. The trays were already half empty and disappearing fast. I should have made more brownies. It took about five minutes before the 341 pulled into the station and Carson and Dodds climbed out, walking like zombies, like we all did at the end of the shift. I don't know how Carson saw the brownies with all the people here, but he headed straight for them and grabbed the second to last one. I'll make this quick so A shift can go home and get some sleep, Chief said. We have some people moving on and we have some new recruits. Sanders on A shift has opted to become a nurse and is starting his internship in two weeks. All the guys cheered. Tate from C shift is moving to Vegas and transferring to a station down there. His wife transferred from the bank up here down to there, Chief said. What do they got that we don't have? Dietrich yelled. Dancing girls, Banner yelled. The chief rolled his eyes. As you already know, Carson is retiring for real next week. Ethan, you're supplying brownies for the party. Everybody cheered. Carson was loudest. Dodds wants to graduate from an ambulance to a fire engine, Chief said. Which shift? Dodds asked. Don't put him on the same team as Ethan. Dodds needs to lose a few, Carson said and everybody cheered or laughed at the same time. Quiet down, Chief yelled. Station 343 is almost ready. They only have a pumper and an ambulance for now, but the city is arranging funding for an additional paramedic truck and paramedics. Between us and 342, we'll supply people to get it up and running and train some newbies. If you'd like to apply, see me later. Priority is for those people who live in the area, but anyone who wants can try. If I go, can I be Chief? Dietrich yelled. If Dietrich's chief, I'm not going, Steph yelled. Ethan and his brownies stay, Tia yelled. Quiet down, Chief Alvers said. There are three new guys to help keep things running in the meantime. Everybody say hi to Bacon. The blonde man waved. Hi, guys. Bacon worked a fire crew in Salt Lake for five years, Chief said. Welcome to Nevada, Banner yelled. Finally, someone can show Dietrich how to do his job, Steph said. He won't listen to the rest of us, Tia said. The important question, can he cook? Dietrich yelled. It's my wife that can cook. I'm pretty good with the barbecue, though, Bacon said. Barbecued steaks. I want you on A shift, Dietrich said. Next is Xavier. Xavier just graduated EMT training and will be joining the ambulance team. This is his first job, Chief said. Xavier nodded at us gave a hesitant smile, and lifted his hand. Tia gets to train another newbie, Dietrich yelled. Hope he can cook as well as the last one, Steph said. Can it, people, Chief said. We have one more recruit. I wish I could present Lewis, but he's at the county, finishing up some paperwork, so he'll join us tomorrow. He drove an ambulance in Georgia, and just finished his EMT certificate so he can drive in Nevada. Can he cook, Banner yelled. You'll have to ask him, Chief said. I'm not sure where to put these guys on the rotation, but for now, they'll be doing ride-alongs for the next week to get a feel for how we do things in the Butte while I figure out staffing issues. Babysitting duty? Don't put them on my shift, Dietrich said. When I heard I might have to babysit your fat butt, I almost quit, Bacon said. Good thing Chief talked me out of it. Ethan, no more brownies for Dietrich. The sugar is making him crazy like a two-year-old, Steph yelled. Make nice, everybody, especially you, Dietrich. You all remember your first day, so make new friends and make their lives easier. If you give them a hard time, Dietrich, guess who will have toilet duty for the month? Ours, the police stations, and the drunk tank. Chief, don't pick on me, Dietrich said. Chief gave him the stare. Then make it so I don't have to. I'll announce the official transfers in a week. You have until Tuesday to make any requests. Chief? That's two new guys driving the ambulances, Tia said. I know, Tia. Since Carson's leaving, you'll be the most experienced driver. I want your input about who you think will work well together, Chief said. A shift, go home. B shift, time to get to work. That must be a record. 
The brownies were gone 15 minutes after I arrived. Good thing I had one earlier. Xavier stood nervously by the 341, waiting for Tia and me. Hi, I'm the new guy, Xavier Clark. What do we do first? That's Tia. She's senior, and I'm Ethan. I'm junior, I said. We do the first thing we do every morning. Respect the rig, Tia and I said together at the same time. Which means we stock it, wash it, vacuum it, throw out any trash, top off the tank, and sanitize the back, I said. Ethan, get the list, Tia said. I climbed into the back and removed the folder she meant. First thing, Xavier, memorize this. This is where everything goes in the rig, Tia said. You're kidding, Xavier said. No, we're not. First thing every morning, we have to make sure everything is in place and fully stocked, I said. Sometimes the previous shift goes through a lot of something. We have to make sure it's there. But memorize, Xavier said. You have to remember, it's not just you and the rig. There are five other people who use it, plus paramedics. It's also the same layout the 342 uses and what the 343 will use, Tia said. That seems stupid, Xavier said. Sometimes when both ambulances are called together on an emergency and the paramedics need an extra oxygen tank or gauze or a splint or a backboard, you don't have time to be picky about which ambulance you get it from. When things settle down, you can make an accounting then, Tia said. Each object has a place and goes to that place every time, I said. If the paramedics need something, and if you have to search for it because somebody in the previous shift put it in the wrong place, the patient could die, I said. You don't have to like it, but you have to memorize it, Tia said. You can't leave the rig a mess. We represent the state of Nevada and the Butte. We are professionals and must look it whenever we deal with people, I said. Your apartment can be a mess. Your car can be a mess. I don't care what's in your backpack, but the rig can never be a mess, Tia said. The alarm rang. 341, code 1, road traffic accident with injuries, person trapped under the bus. Police are on scene. Paramedics required. Ambulance required. Fire attendants required. Dispatch said and gave the address. The chief checked the details on his pad. Dispatch, this is Alvers. Code 1 acknowledged. We're on our way. Then he turned to us. Paramedics and ambulance, get out of here now. We'll follow. You heard dispatch, people. Time to put on your big boy pants, Alvers yelled. Chief, Steph whined. Make that big kid pants, Alvers said. Everybody scattered to their rigs, the firemen pulling on their turnout pants and jackets. The paramedics were the first to leave, then us, then the pumper truck. The pumper was fast, but not as fast as the rig or the paramedics. It might have something to do with how much it weighed. 50,000 pounds of truck can slow anything down. This is Ethan of 341. We're on our way. ETA three minutes, I said into the comm. As we left the station, we went priority one. Full S&L. Sirens and lights. I drove. Xavier took the passenger seat and Tia rode in the captain's chair in back. It's a special chair that swivels and tilts so a person can stay strapped in and still perform most types of emergency treatment. We hadn't had time to restock our rig and Tia had to take inventory. What if we were already low on something? Wouldn't you know it? Our first red light was only a block away. I slowed and looked. It was clear. Speeding through a red light with oncoming traffic is the worst part of my job. Most people stop and wait for us to pass. Some people don't realize what's going on. We've had a couple of close calls since I signed on. If the police are with us, those cars get a talking to and sometimes a ticket. Everybody waited for the paramedics and us to pass. I sped through. Ethan of 341 requesting additional information, I asked. Bus has slid and is blocking the road. One person was run over and trapped. Extent of injuries unknown, dispatch said. No word on other injuries at this time. When I could, I drove fast, but there was always a chance some idiot driver would pull out of a side street. Driving an ambulance meant the driver had to watch for everything. Horn, lights, sirens didn't mean squat when somebody had their earbuds in. We made good time. The cops had opened a path for us almost to the bus. We pulled up and unloaded the stretcher. The paramedics had arrived before us, but the pumper truck was at least another minute behind us. Shit, Tia said, and pointed. The bus turned out to be a school bus. Officer Lopez was first on scene and the officer in charge. Tia and I brought the stretcher over to him. Xavier followed. 
The kids were grouped together about a hundred feet away from the bus, screaming and crying. The bus driver, a middle-aged woman, was yelling hysterically, I didn't see him. I didn't see him. Another guy screamed, I can't feel my legs. Tia and I glanced at each other. This was a bad one. What's the situation? Tia asked Lopez. Bus driver was about to pick up a load of kids, and some guy in a skateboard was in the way, and she didn't see him. Some mom tried to cut in front of the bus to drop their kid off. The bus had to swerve. Bus driver braked hard. The bus slid, hitting the car that had caused the problem. The skateboarder went under the bus and into the wheels. Paramedics are with him now. We have a lot of panicking kids and a screaming bus driver, not to mention the mom and her daughter the bus rear-ended. Several units are on the way to handle crowd control and traffic. How many injured, I said. One critically. I don't know about the rest, Officer Lopez said. Between the screaming kids, a bus driver who's panicking, and the car they hit, it's a circus. Tia shook her head. I hate accidents involving kids. Lopez, get the 342 here. Xavier, you're with me. We'll start with oxygen for the bus driver and see if that will calm her down. We'll do the same with the kids. Ethan, take the stretcher to the paramedics and see what they need, she said. I'll grab the backboard and neck brace just in case, I said, and ran back to the rig. When I deal with something like this, I have to shunt the emotions away. It sounds cold and uncaring, but I retreat into professionalism so I can function. Later, over a beer, I might tell some friends about this so I can vent a little. But Mary, Connor, and Pete became uncomfortable when I talked about my day. They stopped asking about my job a long time ago. With a stretcher, backboard, and neck brace, I returned to the scene. The bus kept moving over. The bus kept moving over. I can't feel my legs, the man screamed. Only his head and shoulders were visible, sticking out from under the bus. The senior paramedic, Draper, nodded at the other paramedic. We don't have a choice. Braddock held up a syringe, air shot it, and injected the screaming man. The man stopped screaming a moment later. Have you found his ID yet? One of the policemen said. No, Braddock said. We can't get to the patient's wallet, so we don't have an ID. I guess male, early 20s, minor lacerations on face and arms, severe injuries to his back and right arm, critical damage to lower pelvis and spine. I suspect internal bleeding and a shattered pelvis. He's wearing a metal alert diabetic bracelet, Draper said into his calm. I took a quick look. The patient, though he looked different, reminded me of Pete. We refer to the people we rescue as our patients. Part of it is to show respect, and part is to keep us detached emotionally. With some of the accidents, if we start feeling, it could paralyze us and keep us from helping. Taking a breath, I looked again. Caucasian, short blonde hair, green shirt, backpack. It wasn't Pete, but somebody I knew from school. He'd had long black hair back then. I know him. We both went to Montgomery Memorial. Mitch Lassiter. He was in the class ahead of me. I heard he got married. I don't know any more, I said. One of the officers made some notes and spoke into his calm. Braddock, the other one of B-shift paramedics, came over to me and handed me his jacket and a utility knife. Ethan, we have a problem. The patient's shirt is stuck under the tire, and with the way the bus is sitting, it might still be on top of him. You're skinnier than we are. I need you to crawl under the bus and cut him free. Check to see if he's clear, and if he is, then we can slide him out and get him to Long Ridge. Once he's out of the way, the firemen can work on the bus and the cars. So the bus might still be on top of him, I asked, shrugging into the heavy jacket and zipping it up. I hope not, but we can't get him out. Another pair of eyes from underneath might help us out, Braddock said. I'm on it, I said. The patient lay face up on the ground, just behind the rear wheels of the bus. Draper was busy inserting an IV in the patient's upper arm, and one of the policemen held it. The patient's left hand had a gold ring. Being run over by a bus meant a 90% chance of a broken back. What surprised me? There wasn't as much blood as I expected. His injuries except for a few cuts and scrapes on his hands and face, were confined to his lower torso. If he survived, he'd probably be paralyzed. One thing I did know, he'd need immediate surgery if he was to live. I got on my stomach and crawled under the bus to the guy. The bottom of the bus was greasy and covered in tar and dust. Inch by inch, I crawled across the asphalt until I reached him. A bus had a double rear wheel to help support the weight. The patient was clear of the outer wheel, but not the inside wheel. His shirt was under the tires. His pelvis seemed wrong, broken. 
Focus, Ethan. Tell Pete about it later. We see you. Can you see what's trapping him? Braddock said. Edging as close as I could, I reached over the patient with the knife. His shirt. Give me a moment. I tried slicing, but the angle was wrong, and I couldn't get the pressure. I tried sawing the fabric, but the knife only tore it. I reached over the patient and ripped the shirt. He's free. Try it now. I yelled. We still can't move him, Draper yelled. I took a closer look. His lime green backpack was also wedged under the tire, and the pack was still on the patient's back. I fumbled at the straps, sawing through one of them. Try it now, I said. They eased him out, and first thing they did was strap him to the backboard and put the neck brace on him. The pumper truck showed up, and the firefighters jogged over to us. Clint, the B-shift shift chief, reached under the bus and helped me out. You know that's our job, right? Does that mean I get a pay raise and you bring the brownies? I joked. My wife would kill me if I tried to cook anything, Clint said. We have to use humor with cases like this. Otherwise we might freeze. We can't let the fear paralyze us, no matter how bad the situation is. My job wasn't done. I gave the coat back to Braddock and took over holding the IV bag as the paramedics lifted the patient onto the stretcher. We ran him to the rig. Time was critical. Officer Lopez ran up to us and looked at the unconscious man. Clarification on the report. His name is Mitch Parker, not Lassiter. He took his husband's name, Officer Lopez said. You know him, I said. I helped him out of a bad scene a couple of years ago, and Mitch teaches my son karate, Officer Lopez said. His husband, Jared, manages the Java dive. I'll contact him. By that time, we had gotten to the rig. I climbed in, still holding the IV bag. Xavier, assist Ethan and Braddock, Tia said. Ethan, I'm driving. Lock and load, people. Translation, lock the stretcher in the back and load your butts on board because I'm driving fast. We got the stretcher in the rig and locked it down. I hung the IV bag from a special hook and took a seat on the fold-down bench on the side. Xavier sat next to me. Braddock took the captain's chair. He clapped the front of the compartment. Tia, we're locked and loaded, he said. Dispatch, this is 341, code 1, priority 1, Tia said. Fast ball incoming. Please inform the emergency room to stand by. Affirmative, 341, code 1, priority 1, acknowledged. Long Ridge informs us they are ready to play catch, Dispatch said. Tia sped off. Full SNL. Braddock kept up a running commentary with Long Ridge about our patient's condition, what had been done, and current vital signs. I monitored the IV. I reached into the drawers and cupboards and got whatever Braddock needed. I tried not to look at the patient, at the tire marks around his waist, at his stillness. He's not breathing right. Oxygen, Braddock ordered. Oxygen, understood, I said, and reached into a cupboard for the mask and equipment. I handed it to Xavier to attach, but Xavier didn't move. Taking the mask from him, I attached it to the patient. Braddock frowned. I don't like the patient's blood pressure or heart rate. Braddock said into his comm. This is Dr. Anderson. You're delivering the patient to ER2. Tell me everything. Xavier looked a little gray and looked out the back windows. Are you okay? I asked. A guy got ran over. How can you be so calm? Xavier said. His hand shook a little. We have to be, Braddock said. Ethan, check the drip. Anderson wants it increased to 10 cc's. 10 cc's. Understood, I said. We delivered the patient to Long Ridge and ran with him and the nurses as far as the emergency room doors would let us. They transferred him to one of their stretchers and prepped the patient for emergency x-rays and surgery. We got a replacement backboard and brace, took a quick pit stop. One of the nurses handed us a couple bottles of water. Then we headed to our station to restock, clean the rig, fill out reports. All the stuff we should have done before we set out. Well, we attempted to. 341, code 1, ambulance required. Cardiac case at the Happy Years Retirement Home, paramedics en route, dispatch said. I glanced at the screen on the dashboard for details. This is Ethan of 341, code 1 acknowledged, 341 responding. I played rock, paper, scissors with Tia to see who would drive. I won and climbed behind the wheel. We sped away from Long Ridge, priority 1, full SNL. It looks like it's going to be one hell of a shift. Thank you everybody for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed. We'll see you next week. Peace.